As I was saying earlier, that one of the really big questions for us is this question of the end of poverty. And the fascinating thing of having Tamara and Stuart with us is that we are looking at how the first world now can look and take cues from the third world. What are the third world solutions for a first world recession? For the longest time, uh, everyone on the team knew Tamara Abed as the woman uh, who President Bar Barack Obama has on speed dial. Uh, there's a reason why President Obama has her on his speed dial. It's because Tamara, who has many degrees in finance and you know, w was on the uh, venture capitalist uh, market, in 2003 joined BRAC, which is truly one of the most awe-inspiring uh, organizations in the world. It's the Bangladesh Rural Advancement Committee. Uh, it deals with 1,20,000 people. She particularly is heading a section called Arong, which is a lifestyle retail, where she works with 65,000 artisans. She also heads the dairy division of BRAC. They're working in all the districts of Bangladesh. And BRAC was set up in 1972 by her father, Sir Fazle Hassan Abed. And uh, they are now taking their model to all the countries in the neighborhood, Sri Lanka, Pakistan, Afghanistan, and to several countries in Africa. Stuart Hart, of course, uh, wrote a path-breaking book called The Fortune at the Bottom of the Pyramid with C.K. Prehlad a few years ago. He's written many books after that, Capitalism at the Crossroad. And uh, today, particularly, I'm really excited to have Stuart Hart with us because yesterday, you know, we had uh, Dayamani Barla, a tribal activist from Jharkhand, and Aruna Roy, one of our most preeminent activists in India, both of them urging us and urging the corporate world, urging decision makers everywhere to listen, to listen to the dispossessed, not as disruptionist forces, but as something that can be a creative engagement, as foretellers of the world to come. And Stuart Hart has something of a similar message. He's speaking it in a language that I think the powerful will understand, and that is something that we are going to focus on today. So Tamara, I wanted to start with you. Uh, one, to explain to all of us a little bit about the work that you're doing at BRAC, and then to say what are the third world solutions that you think the first world should take from us? Um, I work in BRAC. Uh, BRAC takes a holistic approach to poverty, so we work in education, health, microfinance, legal services, and importantly, livelihood creation. And that's where BRAC's social enterprises come in. So we take a triple bottom line approach um, where we engage with people in rural communities um, to create livelihoods uh, by providing inputs uh, that are much needed for them to run their businesses, quality inputs, and marketing um, so that they can run their businesses. And, uh, the, and while we make profit for the enterprises to be sustainable in an environmentally uh, responsible manner. Um, so the first enterprise that I run is Arung. Uh, it is the largest lifestyle store chain in Bangladesh, and we employ 65,000 artisans, um, as Shoma said. Uh, what we do is we work with these artis artisans in two different ways. We have production centers across Bangladesh, so we have 620 sub-centers where about 25 to 100 women in villages work on making crafts. Uh, which we then market through our outlets in uh, the urban markets. Uh, we also work with small producers, small entrepreneurs, who take orders from us and employ people in small units, cottage industries, uh, in their own villages, and then supply to us. Um, in Bragg Dairy, we uh, collect milk from about 50,000 smallholder farmers across Bangladesh through 100 chilling centers. Um, that we then bring to our factory, pasteurize, uh, package it, and process it, and distribute it in urban markets. Um, so in the work that, so to answer your question, third world solutions for a first world recession, um, I want to start first with some basic things. Um, the first thing that I think the first world could learn from the third world is to save money. Um, there was a negative savings rate in the U.S., um, and people were living well beyond their means up until 2008, um, when the recession hit, and finally people started saving. Uh, and the national savings rate was, of the U.S. is 3%, compare that to Japan of 2.6%. Compare that to the Chinese, who have been saving between 40 and 50% of their income for the last 15 years, Indians saving at 35%. 
So I think one of the basic things uh, that the first world can learn is, is to save money. Secondly, um, I think, again, something very basic, stop wasting food. Um, the average European or North American consumer wastes about 95 to 115 kgs of food per year. And this is food that is unopened, untouched, or just thrown away. Compare that to an average consumer in Sub-Saharan Africa, South Asia or Southeast Asia, uh, and we waste about 6 to 11 kgs of food per person per year. Um, so food wasted by consumers in rich countries amount to about 222 million tons. That is roughly the equal, equal to the entire food production of Sub-Saharan Africa. So people in Western countries need to teach their children not to waste food like we do, um, like, like we teach our children in our part of the world. Um, other simple things before we get into, um, you know, stuff that we do, stuff that Bragg does. Um, try to fix or repair things before you buy a new one. Um, we fix everything in our part of the world, from telephones to shoes to TVs. People in the West just go and buy a new one. Um, things like recycling. We, uh, we recycle containers, newspapers, find different ways to consume as many parts of a vegetable or fruit or chicken that we possibly can. Um, and, and then this brings me to uh, some of the unique models of poverty alleviation that have come up from the third world, uh, specifically from Bangladesh. So if we look at unemployment, um, but, uh, if you look at unemployment, unemployment rates across the world, below 5%, it's mostly Asian, Latin American, and CIS countries. So among the 50-odd countries that have unemployment below 5%, only four countries are from the first world. They are Denmark, Switzerland, Norway, and Austria. The US has a staggering unemployment rate of nearly 10%, the UK close to 8%. So what can we do um, to tackle this issue. Um, so what we're talking about and what Bragg does, uh, one of the models that can be applied is micro-franchising, which is basically applying the traditional model of franchising to small businesses in the developing world. So it's time to start favoring a bottom-up bottom approach rather than looking at how economics can trickle down to the bottom. And we need bubble up entrepreneurship from the bottom. So it's time to look at the youth as an underutilized asset rather than a liability on, on the societal balance sheet. So BRAC has created networks of mi micro... If I could just cut in here, Tamara. I, want, I wanted to bring Stuart into this. Stuart, one of your big arguments before I come to the voice of the planet that you're talking about is also, you know, Tom earlier was talking about the fact that too big has become a problem. Uh, your own argument is that the new way forward really is to break things up. Could you talk a little bit about that, you know, to have more small enterprises widely distributed? Yeah, <clears throat> so when this notion, this piece that, that uh, CK and I uh, did now going on 13, 14 years ago, uh, of course everyone knows uh, CK tragically passed away last year, uh, which was you know, a huge loss for the world. But when we first crafted that, it was premised on the idea that if you looked at uh, multinational companies and sort of the corporate way of thinking, uh, almost all of it, well, there, there, was a, there was a great focus on emerging markets, right, even then, in the late 90s. But what emerging markets meant, and I think still does by and large, is incrementally taking existing products, taking some cost out of them, and reaching the rising middle class, right, in India and China and Brazil and so forth. That's great, right? That, that can be a growth driver at some level. But I think we came to the realization, you know, CK and I back in the late 90s, that uh, for the corporate world, the rest of humanity, which really amounts to two-thirds of humanity, is left out of the picture totally. And that, by and large, uh, that, that uh, you know, two-thirds of humanity, those four or five billion people, the focus was aid, was philanthropy, and then there's a, a lot of ground up, bottom up innovation that's happening at, you know, on the ground now, so we can call it social entrepreneurship. But that business per se really didn't have any focus on it at all. And that was really where the original motivation came from, the piece called The Fortune at the Bottom of the Pyramid, which incidentally wasn't called that initially. That was, we were talking about this yesterday. That was an editor's choice. <laughs> 
And uh, the original piece was called Raising the Bottom of the Pyramid. And that, was, that was our original title. And our core focus was, if you were going to do that successfully, it would mean transforming thinking about strategy and business models in a fundamental way. In other words, it's, I think in some, at some level, the idea has, has come to be seen as, well, it's really just taking more cost out of existing products, putting them in sachet packages, and then selling them to the poor, right? Sort of the selling to the marketing to the poor way of thinking. That was never the intent. And you know, so I think it's exciting now that I see much more activity around the concept of innovation being driven from the base of the pyramid, because that was really the core idea to begin with. And the, the only way that can work effectively, you know, since large centralized you know, technology-based solutions cannot apply, is to incubate tomorrow's you know, leapfrog, disruptive, point of view, small scale, renewable, sustainable, safe technologies which have struggled to come into commercial reality you know, in a place like the United States. To begin with those and incubate them, the, you know, the bottom of the pyramid is an innovation cauldron. And that's where I think we can most effectively bring forward on a commercial basis tomorrow's technologies. And incubate a more sustainable living at the same time, create, generate livelihoods, which is, which is really what BRAC is all about. It's, you know, it's about embedded business models that lift the base, not just selling cheap products. Uh, and then that becomes then the, the basis for really taking this out and trickling it back up to the world, right? You know, the, the term is reverse innovation these days. But, I, but it, it really it forces you to think in a different way. R rather than innovation is always driven from the top, and then as you're saying, maybe eventually, you know, we get, you know, you know with, with the learning curve, we get cheaper and cheaper, but they might be able to trickle down. To reverse that completely and see that the, the real place to incubate and the kind of the cauldron for innovation is precisely those places that have been least well served because you don't have the, you know, the tremendous momentum, you know, the incumbency that, that would exist at the top of the pyramid. You don't have the bureaucracy that, that uh, restricts what you're able to do. So it, the opportunity is huge to create what comes next. And I think that's really the big challenge in front of us. You know, I, I thought it was absolutely fascinating that you were saying people who are really studying in the business schools uh, in the US, you know, taking big f uh, fancy degrees should actually go down to all the sort of, you know, dispossessed and the poor rural urban uh, centers of the world and that they're going to do more learning there. So from both of you, you know, just to spark our minds, can you give an example of what you think could typically happen, you know, an illustrative example of the kind of innovation you think can happen from the bottom? Um, I'll give you an example of, for example, seed distributors that BRAC has. So BRAC has a seed company which uh, produces high quality seeds and that's exactly what farmers need and they don't have access to. Uh, so we have seed distributors who educate fellow villagers on efficient farming techniques while selling higher yielding seeds. So that employs, gives them a livelihood, helps the rural community and, um, uh, and also you know, spreads awareness about farming techniques using products that they're selling. Um, another example, uh, for example, is um, a model where women in villages earn money offering basic medical services, um, goods and services to our neighbors in a sustainable way. Um, so for example, in the US, if you can't see a doctor, there's no inexpensive solution available. Um, compare that to the solution I just talked about in Bangladesh, or for example, Chinese barefoot doctors. So these are cheap, inexpensive, replicatable solutions um, you know, that can be scaled up, that are sustainable, and that have social impact. If, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Stuart Tamara, what you're talking about is great for sustainability. It's about also empowering people on the ground. But Stuart, is your, your argument also that innovation can happen on the ground, which will actually become uh, potential money making, you know, because I can't see how large corporations are going to be interested in some of the stuff that you're talking about, Tamara, you know. Can that translate into big money for, for corporations? As I think of this, the, the kind of the skill set and the capability that she's talking about and that BRAC has exhibited, uh, there, there's a knowledge and skill set that, that involves working collaboratively with people in communities to co-create businesses as opposed to air dropping in products, right, which would be the typical corporate mentality. Do a marketing research study, figure out what the price point is, design the product at a distance, and sell it. So I, that just 
fundamentally doesn't work. You know, in fact, the, the original title of the piece, The Fortune at the Bottom of the Pyramid, many people have kind of interpreted that, well, that, that's really what it's, there's a bag of money, at the, let's go get it, right? That, that, again, that was never the intent. What it really takes to succeed is to develop the sort of empathetic, you know, think about it, rather than finding a fortune at the bottom of the pyramid, it's about creating a fortune with the bottom of the pyramid. That's a different skill set, and for people in companies, there's a lot to be learned from BRAC. Right? Now, having said that, there's also enormous potential, as I see it, to take shelf technology. I mean, we were, you know, it was interesting listening to Bjorn's, uh, Lomberg's piece yesterday, the idea that we need uh, to redirect massive amounts of R&D. I don't completely disagree that there's more R&D required, but as I look at it, you know, we are, we're actually, the world is sort of drowning in technology. You know, we have, I'm at Cornell University, if I look at the university where I am, literally thousands of intellectual properties and patents sit on the shelf there doing nothing. The, you know, the typical commercialization model is to license them to existing corporations. Most of them are small scale, point of use, renewable, bio-based, disruptive, and that's why they don't get licensed, so they sit there. And so a big focus of, of you know, what I've been trying to do, and in fact, what we're, one of the things we're trying to do is create a new institute here in India. You know, we were talking about that yesterday, too, in Bangalore, something called the Indian Institute for Sustainable Enterprise. And the idea is, can we take these shelf technologies, which exist by the thousands, that have the potential to, to leap us to what comes next, you know, I think of it as the green leap, but that languish at the existing, because there is no, there's a resistant market at the top of the pyramid because of their uh, disruptive nature. Can we take those technologies and combine them with the sort of entrepreneurial capability that we're talking about here that would allow you to tailor these technologies in a very different way, kind of direct them to solve different kinds of problems and thereby create tomorrow's companies, industries, and more sustainable way of living at the same time. So that's what we're really looking to do, you know, at this uh, new institute, the Indian, Indian Institute for Sustainable Enterprise. And I think the potential is huge. And I, you know, I think this is where tomorrow's industries are going to come from. Yeah, I, I think that's a fascinating idea that future corporations of the 21st century are going to come from the slum clusters of the world, you know? That, and, that's the, and the rural areas. And, you know, we need, as I think about it, I think Tom, Tom Frieden has a way of really succinctly kind of hitting the nail on the head. And when he was talking about the great disruption in a, you know, last year in a column, I think, you know, he used the term, we are now in the, the period of the great disruption, which is the time when mother nature and father greed hit the wall at the same time. Yeah. That's, you know, that, that's the period we're in. And so the question becomes, how, how can the commercial sector, right, how can the enterprise sector play a positive and proactive role to, uh, to move us more rapidly toward a sustainable world, which is where we need to go. And we need to go fast. Uh, and so the way I look at it, the, one of the things that the, the market approach or the entrepreneurial approach, one of its advantages is its ability to move quickly. In other words, if we can craft entrepreneurial solutions that generate new economic activity that take us to what comes next, uh, we, can, we can get ahead of the policy curve, right? I mean, if we wait for Washington to legislate these things into existence, we're going to be waiting a long time. <laughs> Tamara, you know, you, we were saying about social enterprise and about this... Uh, innovation locally, you know. You've moved from Bangladesh now to, as I was saying, almost all the countries in the subcontinent and to five or six countries in Africa. Could you give us some examples of, you know, what you've learned on the ground and how something that you felt was good or was working in Bangladesh actually mutated when it was taken to Africa or, or new ideas came up from the ground? Could you just give us some examples? Sure. Uh, first, I'd just like to clarify, uh, Shoma, that I don't think what we're saying is that co the corporations will come from the ground. I think what we're talking about is big business, social entrepreneurs, uh, people interested in business, engaging with rural communities, bringing them as part of the puzzle, not just selling things to them, but, but employing them or involving them in activities and finding things that rural communities need. Um, as opposed to trying to sell things that, yeah, transplanting things right. uh, that we need. Um, the sachet packet on the brain. Yeah. <laughs> um, so one of the examples uh, that have worked well for BRAC uh, in Bangladesh that, that we then took to Uganda, for example, is we used to have a huge problem of um, a huge percentage of our chicken dying in the villages due to lack of vaccinations and lack of inoculation. Um, so BRAC trained poultry vaccinators who basically go around villages inoculating chickens. 
And this is a concept, this provides them with a livelihood and uh, solves a, a social problem. Um, this concept was taken to Uganda and um, so Uganda, about 35% of chickens succumb to um, disease, which is 10% and has been brought down to 10% in Bangladesh and working very well. Um, so a solution found innovated in Bangladesh, you know, taken on the ground in Africa, in Uganda, and working wonders there. So, is, Forgive me if, I, if I'm looking a bit, uh, you know, naive about this, but so how does the economy of that work? Is it the small chicken owner, you know, just in different villages, they're willing to pay for this uh, person who's coming to vaccinate? Is that how the economy of absolutely, it works? Absolutely, absolutely, and they are willing to pay for it um, because otherwise their chickens die, and this is, you know, one of their very few assets that they have. Um, so it's not that people are not willing to pay for services, they just don't have them, they don't have access to them. You know, earlier in the session, uh, Tom and Pratap were talking about uh, restructuring the way capitalism works, you know, new regulatory frameworks, a whole lot of things. But Stuart, you've been talking about a new capitalism, you know, that uh, we need to, like you just said, the green leap, you know. And I was absolutely fascinated by this new concept you've come up with, which is the voice of the planet. Uh, could you share with our audience what that is and, you know, how it's the next step from the voice of the customer? Yeah, well, I mean, the, the simple idea really is that voice of the customer, I think, is pretty well integrated into the, into the mindset and practice of most, you know, uh, large companies in the world today. And so there's, there's a, a whole set of methodologies and disciplines for effectively listening to the voice of the customer. We've been, as business people, relatively less skillful when it comes to listening to all of the other voices that exist out there in the world that might turn out to hold, to hold the real keys to the future. So the, the idea behind the voice of the planet is how do we begin to build in the kind of the organizational capacity and capability uh, to, to actually not only listen but enter into a dialogue, not just with customers, but all stakeholders you know, that are associated with the company. And those even that don't have voices, like nature, right? How do we listen to the voice of the planet from that point of view and effectively incorporate that into the very business, the kind of the fiber of the business that we're up to? And what I find, at least, is that if, if we're able to do that, you know, I, I think of it as engaging previously uninvolved or fringe stakeholders, proactively reaching out to them, people who, you know, companies would think, we just have absolutely no connection to this at all. Why, why would we, you know, they're not part of our business model. Or they were seen as impediments. Yeah, or just irrelevant, right? But uh, if you proactively reach out and engage people in rural areas, right, or in slums, or invite in people who really understand what's going on in terms of climate or, uh, you know, uh, rainforest ecosystems or what have you, you learn a lot about possible innovations that you can build, right? And, uh, and especially if you do it as a dialogue, you're in a position then to generate entirely new concepts for business. I mean, I, if, if I think about, again, Bjorn Lomberg's point yesterday, we, meet, we need more R&D in order to get the price down, you know, in order to make this green stuff affordable. I agree with him, right? But I think maybe the best way we could do it is not just focus on the technical R&D. We need business model R&D, right? How, how do we take all of this technology that we've got and actually put it into play? And the only way you do that is by engaging with the people who need it the most. You know, uh, as I was saying, I find this particularly fascinating because as a journalist, you know, we go out to the ground a lot and one finds n number of development projects, industrial projects, infrastructure projects that are stalled by people's resistance on the ground. And to my mind, it seems that if businesses are to do well and if development is to come, even in the way we imagine it today, that these resistances have to be worked into the balance sheet, you know, that companies have to do business in a way that makes sense to people on the ground. And uh, something what Stuart was saying was that you re rethink the idea of shareholders, you know, that your primary shareholder forces you or asks you to improve on what you're already doing. But to involve activists, uh, the displaced, the urban poor, the rural poor, into the company thinking becomes a license to imagine, you know. So, uh, yeah. To, to imagine new ways of doing business. So yet again, Stuart, you know, to, to make it uh, more alive in our heads, can you give an example of any society where this has happened? You know? Yeah, well, I mean, I think it, to some extent, this is about next practice and not so much current best practice. 
But having said that, there are emerging examples, right, that, which I think are pretty exciting. One, in the, and so there actually there are many in, here in India, right? And, and we can you, you can look at the renewable energy sector and find lots of really interesting entrepreneurial companies. You know, Cosmos Ignite, uh, Barefoot Power, Husk Power, uh, dist distributed world generator. There are lots of them, right? Try, trying to do what we're talking about and beginning to get traction. But I'll, I'll give one example from China, since you know, kind of a little friendly competition is always a good thing. Because there, there, I think there are really interesting things happening in China too. Uh, and so some of you may be familiar, there, there is an emerging technology for solar hot water, right? That's, in, that's essentially glass vacuum tube solar, not flat panel solar, right? Kind of the traditional solar hot water technology is flat panel. Turns out to be pretty expensive, right? As we come back to Lomborg's point. Uh, so in, you know, in the West, you rely on incentives so that people in Germany and California can buy these things, right? Because they're pretty expensive. Well, in, in China, you had this new technology that, that developed, you know, came out of Tsinghua University, and there was a company called Tsinghua Solar and another called Huamin Solar, that initially they were sort of brainwashed by this thinking, you know, that, well, you know, green products are for rich people, you know, so they, their initial idea was to take this breakthrough technology, which is just literally gla highly engineered glass vacuum tubes with some medium that catches the sun's energy, and then it's embedded in a water tank and it heats it. I mean, it's very simple, but it works, it's highly effective less than half the cost of traditional flat panel solar. No rare metals, no toxics, no antifreeze, no nothing. I mean, it's really a clean technology. But it, their initial uh, idea was, well, let's you know, take this and sell it to the rich people in Shanghai and Beijing because they were brainwashed by the thinking that you know, green products are for rich people. It went nowhere, right? Because I mean, the simple fact is most of us are already set in our ways right? and there's a lot of unlearning involved to adopt something like that. Because people are, are already pretty well served in those places with subsidized coal power and so forth. So just out of, almost out of desperation because it, the strategy just wasn't working, they began to look elsewhere. And where they looked was the towns, you know, the rural areas in China where people just did not have regular access to natural gas or hot water. Or, and that's where they really found a model which allowed them to kind of co-create with people in these towns, you know, kind of the rural areas and the towns a business model for bringing this vacuum tube solar hot water to those areas. And that's just absolutely exploded in the last 10 years. It's now a $10 billion industry in China alone. Yeah. Uh, that industry will be going global, you know, in the next year, two, or three, and then begin to trickle up. You know, again, I think it's the reverse innovation model that we need to be thinking about. When that happens, look out solar companies in the US and Europe and so forth, because that, I think that's, that's sort of the cauldron of innovation. I've heard the first twinkle. So Tamara, I'm just going to ask you, uh, I know that BRAC deals a lot with women. And you know, the first world approach to Pakistan, Afghanistan would have been a lot of aid and philanthropic uh, organizations, but uh, also to bring malls and you know, huge consumption to these societies to uplift them. Uh, what has been your experience in Afghanistan and Pakistan, particularly because you work a lot with women? What have the innovations been in your work uh, in these countries? Um, well, in Pakistan and Afghanistan, I mean, women all over the world are dying to do things. Um, it's just a question of involving them. And if society uh, creates a situation where they can be involved, um, they, they just jump at it. So our um, experience in Pakistan and Afghanistan have been, you know, our girls are, Afghani girls are coming to BRAC schools. Uh, Afghani women are setting up small businesses with loans from BRAC. Um, there's been a huge response, uh, both in Pakistan and Afghanistan. What is the kind of work that you do there? What are the crafts or what is the business model that you have there? Um, I don't work, uh, <laughs> I don't work on the international side, so uh, you know, I wouldn't be able to tell you in detail, but it's um, micro-enterprises um, of what people can be involved in. So in Pakistan, for example, there's a, you know, a lot of handicrafts that women make. Um, and then sell. Uh, there are also other enterprises, uh, you know, the same kind of dairy farming, things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, Stuart, before the bell rings and we are thrown out of the stage, what is the, you know, you spoke about reverse uh, innovation as being the one big thing that we should be thinking about. What's the last thought that you would like to leave the audience with? Well, I mean, I think the, to, to me, that really is the goal, you know, in the next, in the next decade, how do we take the 
inventory of next generation technology we have, which is going nowhere right now, and combine it with the entrepreneurial skills and capability, how do we bring those together to really create a revolution in the world? Because I, I think that's, and, and it has to happen in the next 10 years. I mean that, so I, I view this as the biggest business opportunity in the history of the world. Uh, and it, but it's the best kept, kept secret out there. <laughs> you had a lovely <laughs> phrase for it. Uh, uh, Stuart has now started a blog called The Voice of the Planet. And as, as I was saying, he's talking about incorporating that into business. And there's a lovely phrase you use, which has stayed with me, which is that he said uh, businesses should look at all this entire spectrum of shareholders, the dispossessed, uh, the green activists, the, the thinkers, people like Diamani Barla, as the competitive imagination. Uh, that will fuel new thinking in business. Thank you very much for listening in. Thank you.